Okay, so I'm going to start recording. So just so everybody knows we're recording, um, feel free to turn on or off your camera. Um, thanks for uh, having my Naomi. It's, it's good to see everybody. Um, I'm going to start um, by just uh, kind of setting up the meeting here. Um, as you all now know from just listening to us chat the last few minutes, there was an issue last time. So first rule of meetups is to be respectful. Um, also the second rule and third rule of, of, of meetups is to be respectful. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna record uh, this meeting so we can post it later. Um, you can feel free to uh, post questions in the chat window. Um, I'll, I'll try to glance over and, and check the windows uh, every so often, but more likely than not, I will just wait until uh, I'm done and then uh, take questions. And I'm happy to just uh, continue chatting for as long uh, as we can. There's a hockey game at eight o'clock, so um, we'll have to keep that in mind. Um, so I'll talk about for about 40, 45 minutes, and then, and then I'm happy to take as many questions and, and hopefully have a conversation about uh, what I think are, are important issues. So um, in, in our efforts as uh, people working with data, uh, in, in our efforts to open minds and shape decisions and offer solutions, I think uh, what we need to do is to think intentionally about how we can learn from and speak to the audiences that reflect the, the diversity of uh, America, the world, our communities, and, and the people that we're talking to and talking about. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about today is um, sort of an evolving thought process, um, think as, as I and, and people I work with, think about how we can take a more racial, equitable approach to our data visualizations. Because for many of us, I think we try, and many of us uh, have tried for longer than others, and many of us have, have been more successful than others. Um, many of us try to uh, take a very careful approach in the language that we use in, in our written reports, be them blog posts, reports, or what have you. Um, but perhaps we don't take the same approach uh, when it comes to visualizing our data, when it comes to the, the language that we use, uh, the colors that we use, the icons that we use, um, all sorts of things. So I'm gonna talk about a variety of different strategies today. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, these are evolving thoughts um, and I don't have the answers. These are not certainly not rules, um, but I think the, the, the bottom line of this entire talk is for all of us as people working with data and visualizing data and communicating data to, to start or continue to think stra strategically and carefully about the words and the elements in our visualizations uh, when we are talking about uh, different groups, especially uh, underrepresented groups. So as we all well know, the last six months um, have been uh, um, uh, staggering uh, variety of challenges for, uh, for folks around the world. Here in the United States, um, there's been a racial uh, reckoning. Uh, I, I might say a racial reckoning. It's come decades uh, too uh, long, but we are now seem to be having this discussion around race, uh, gender, uh, equi uh, equitable uh, treatment of, of various groups. And so um, what I want to think about or talk about or, or to I guess, express is how we as people working with data can take the discussion that's taking place in our society and apply it to the everyday work that we are doing so that we can actually do something active. And I think it's a, it's a fairly similar refrain that I've heard from many people that they want to do something, they don't know what that thing is that they can do. Um, and I think one thing that we can do is in our daily lives, in our daily work, is take this more uh, active approach to, in, in and it, to essentially to be an, an, an anti-racist, uh, to, to, to use the parlance that uh, I think many of us are trying to use now, um, to not just uh, read and passively uh, take in this information, but be, be a more active uh, um, participant in this discussion. So uh, before I go any further, let me just tell you very briefly about my lived experience, because I'm a uh, middle-aged, I, ha I hate to say middle-aged, but I do add middle-aged now, middle-aged white male. Um, so I come from that perspective of uh, not uh, uh, directly experiencing racist, uh, uh, racist behavior, discriminatory practices or prejudice against me personally based on the color of my skin. I am uh, Jewish American and I have experienced my uh, share of anti-Semitism uh, over the course of my life, but walking down the street or walking to a, to a store or uh, interacting with police officers, 
I don't have the same uh, challenges and fears that many people of color in the, in the United States do. Um, in addition, as an economist and as someone who writes and thinks a lot about data visualization, um, I'm trying to think carefully about how I can be a better steward of the data that I use, the visualizations that I create, and how I communicate that information. And finally, as, as just a citizen of the US and of the world, and as a father of, of two kids who are, who are appearing in the office right now, figuring out why dad is working so late, um, I'm trying to think more actively about these issues because the only way we can break the cycle of white supremacy and uh, the, the uh, pushing down of, of different underrepresented groups is to, is to have these conversations across the generations and recognize that this is going to be a long uh, conversation that needs to uh, take place now and continue on into the future. So what I'm not gonna talk about today are visualizations that are uh, purposefully racist or purposely discriminatory. There are examples of those, and I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk more about what I think are 99% uh, of, the, of the visualization challenges that we have around these ideas of racial equity and awareness. Um, but there are lots of examples of visualizations that were purposefully created or are purposefully created to embody racist ideas. So as an example, the map you see in front of you uh, was created in the, in the 1930s and 1940s by a, a federal government agency called the Home Owners uh, Loan Corporation, so the HOLC, H-O-L-C. And the HOLC's job was to assess mortgage risk, risk in metropolitan areas around uh, the United States in the 1930s and 1940s. And so they created a whole series of these maps. And the maps are color coded. Um, you can't really see all the all the detail here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna describe them for you in just a moment. Um, you can see you have these green areas and the blue and the yellow and the red. And so in Richard Rothstein's book, um, The Color of Law, um, he writes that the Hulk, which is this, uh, this government agency, it's a federal government agency, the Hulk created color coded maps of every metropolitan area in the nation with the safest neighborhoods colored green and the riskiest areas colored red. And those red areas uh, earned a red color if African Americans lived in it, even if it was a solid middle class neighborhood of single family homes. So these uh, government sponsored, government owned uh, mortgage maps are themselves racist and they perpetuate uh, racism, discrimination, and, uh, and wealth disparities and income disparities across generations across the United States for the last nearly 100 years. So that's not the type of thing I'm gonna dig into today, but I think it's important for us to recognize that those visualizations do exist. They exist today as well. And I'm gonna talk about briefly about just a, a sort of different, uh, a different version of this. Um, but I think it's important for us to recognize where data visualization is today and where it has come from in the past, just the way our structural institutions um, have evolved for better and for worse uh, from a hundred years ago to today. Okay, so I'm gonna start with using language uh, by taking a racial equity awareness. And so, as I mentioned, a lot of us probably are very careful with the text that we use, the words that we use in and around our graphs, uh, but I wanna talk specifically about our, our visualizations. So it's also important to note that this language is not fixed, it is evolving. Nick Steenhouse, who has a really nice blog on um, challenges that people with disabilities face, has written that disability language is never straightforward. It's always nuanced and it's always uh, evolves. Um, so, so what we want to try to do um, as people taking this, taking this language is to try to use people first language. So instead of saying disabled people, for example, we might wanna use the phrase people with disabilities. Same thing with terms um, that refer to uh, people and not their skin color. So we might wanna say, for example, black people and not just the word blacks. So I wanna describe uh, um, uh, how I think about this or, or an example of this uh, by showing you this Tableau uh, visualization. So what I'm showing you here is just the top third of this visualization. There are three similar maps uh, in this visualization. The top one here that you see is for black people in the United States. There's the second one is for Hispanic people and the third one is for, is for white people. And so um, everybody on this call knows, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk quickly. Uh, briefly about what a choropleth map is. So a choropleth map, uh, you color in the geographic units. So it's the states, the countries, the counties, the, the census tracts, what have you, based on the data value. The map you see in front of you is what's called a bivariate choropleth map. So there are two variables being plotted at the same time. So let me zoom in um, on the legend. 
So here's that legend for this map. And so you can see along the horizontal part of this, uh, of this bivariate legend, we have what the author calls more black. So we're going left to right uh, more, uh, uh, counties in this case um, that have a uh, lower density of, of black people living in those counties to counties that have a higher uh, density of black people living in those counties. And then the vertical axis is the poverty rate. So we move from counties with a lower poverty rate to counties with a higher poverty rate. So to think about this, how this bivariate choropleth works, in the bottom left uh, corner of this, of this legend, those are the counties that have a smaller proportion of black people living in the county and a low poverty rate. And you can see in the top left little thumbnail of the map I left up there, you can see it's kind of in the, in the plain states is where you see a bunch of the, of the, yellow, of the yellow colors. If we go in the opposite corner, in the top right corner where that, where that um, dark, dark purple color is, those are counties that have a high proportion of black people living in those counties and the poverty rates are, are higher. So that, as you can see, sort of stretches through the southeast part of the United States. Now, let's focus on this. So now you sort of understand how this map works. Let's focus on the language used in the legend itself. So first off, on poverty. Poverty is an experience. It's not a static description of a person, okay? Um, I, as an individual, go in and can go in and out of poverty based on my income in that year. It's not a static description of, of me as a person. It's an experience. And more importantly, for the discussion that we're going to have tonight, um, uh, black references skin people or references skin color, not people. So both of these terms, we probably want to try to change and um, change to take this more racial equitable approach to our work. So instead, what we might want to use, um, and these are more verbose, admittedly, they're more verbose. They're not as, not as concise and nice and easy to read, but I think probably more respectful of the groups that we are uh, talking about and talking with. So along the horizontal axis, uh, we might use instead of more black, we might use larger proportion of the black population or denser black population. And along the vertical axis, we might use larger proportion of people in poverty. Again, representing that that's the poverty is not a static description, it's an experience. And I will say that the, the author of the original visualization did change this eventually. Uh, we had a conversation and, um, uh, and the creator ultimately changed it to larger black population and more poverty. Um, again, there is a balance here between conciseness um, and, and, and uh, sort of more verbose, uh, longer uh, uh, language. But again, I want to think about how uh, my visualization is going to uh, reflect the people I'm talking about. It's going to affect the people I'm talking to and how these visualizations and my work can be used uh, by policymakers, by decision makers, and other stakeholders. There's other ways to do this. This is a, a picture from a, a, a local um, botanical gardens here. I'm in Northern Virginia. There's a botanical gardens a uh, little uh, ways away. And, you know, I just love the way that they were thinking about naming these different age groups, right? You might usually think that you would name these groups children, adults, and the elderly or senior citizens. I love the change here of going to children, adults, and super adults. I think that's just a more positive, affirming way to label these groups um, as opposed to using some of these, uh, the, the, so maybe the standard language, but maybe it's, 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 uh, it's not um, aware of uh, the groups that we're um, uh, speaking with. Now, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, the language that we use is always evolving. And what's interesting is that um, a lot of uh, people think that whatever the most recent term is, is a term that we should stick with. So I think Latinx is this term to describe the Hispanic or Latino population that people have used and adopted. But it turns out, and this is from a August, 2000, the August 2020 poll that the Pew Research Foundation just, just published. Um, they interviewed Hispanic and Latino adults and they found that two thirds of people, um, of two thirds of people who were interviewed, said that the word Latinx should not be used to describe the Hispanic or Latino population. So, what does this mean for us as people working with data? I think what it means is we need to try to talk to the people that we are communicating with. That maybe in one report I use the term Latinx, but in another report I use the term Hispanic or Latino, and so. This is a big challenge, and this is something that I'm that I'm talking, trying to talk to more and more people about because I think probably most people on this call view themselves as quantitative people. We are data visualization people. We get data. We make graphs. Um, we we are steeped in numbers. And this idea of talking to people, of reaching out to the communities that we are studying and working with and for, that is that is that is not a natural thing for us to do. And so um, I think it's something that we need to start to try to embrace this idea, maybe more of being a journalist or being more of a qualitative researchers. 
Um, so I think we need to uh, consider, uh, you know, reaching out to these groups and something I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a second. I'm just looking at the, um, looking over at the, uh, the chat window here. So, um, so Hope asked if this is two thirds of Latin uh, people surveyed. So my understanding, uh, and I have to go back and just double check, but I believe this is two thirds of Hispanics or Latino people that were surveyed by Pew. So I think this is, this, this is a sample of Hispanics and Latinos. Um, and Anthony mentions um, cringing at the term minority, which I, I completely agree with. Um, and, and, you know, uh, the term minority is, an, and look, again, I'm coming from a perspective of a white male, so I'm certainly not the best person to be talking about how the word minority makes, makes a person feel. Um, but I could certainly understand how that term would make someone feel lesser um, than another group because that is the the word minority. And I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that um, with another word in just in just a moment um, and take it maybe uh, a step further and maybe a step too far. We'll 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 see how how you all think. I'll be I'll be curious to get some reactions. Okay, so I've talked about language. So now let me talk about ordering labels in a purposeful way. Um, and this is um, this is I, I think when I talk about this this concept of racial equity awareness and data visualization. This is the, the concept that I start with. So if you go into basically any economics or social science uh, research journal and you find a data table of summary statistics or regression results that include demographics, that include race, the order that you're going to find 99 times out of 100 is going to be white, black, Hispanic, other. That's the order that you're going to find. And sometimes you'll find Asians and sometimes you'll find uh, Native Americans, but this is the order that you're going to find in 99 out of 100 research papers. And there's no reason why we should be using that order other than we're taking data that is rooted in, and I don't want to use the, the word, um, uh, I don't want to use uh, the word white superiority too much here, but the data sets that are created are rooted in um, these structures um, that have persisted for, you know, dozens or even hundreds of years. So let me demonstrate how, where I think this comes from. So what I'm going to show you is a screenshot of the questionnaire from, I think, six major federal uh, surveys, okay? So this one is from the decennial census. So hopefully you have all filled out your decennial census form. Um, this is question nine on race. So we have um, a box for white, and now, uh, as opposed to 20 years ago, you can now fill in, you can write in, uh, um, you know, if you're German, Irish, English, as it notes here, uh, et cetera. Uh, then we have black or African American. Again, you can write in your, maybe your country of origin, your ethnicity. Then we have American Indian or Alaska Native. And then uh, below that, we have a variety of other check boxes, uh, mostly for, uh, for people from, um, from Asian countries. So Chinese, Filipino, Asian American. And then at the bottom, we have some other race. So this is the decennial census question about race. This is from the uh, Census Bureau's current population survey. So this is uh, the annual, uh, you can think of it uh, almost as the, as the monthly census. So the surveyor says to the person they're interviewing, I'm gonna read you a list of five race categories. You may choose one or more races. For this survey, Hispanic origin is not a race. Are you, and you can see we have these six categories here, white, black, American, Indian, Native, Alaska, Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian, or other. Okay, so there's that order. The survey of income and program participation. So this is a, the, the structure, the way the survey is conducted is a little bit different, but same, same approach. And to your best guess as to the race of the reference person, seven options here, including a D for don't know. The survey of consumer finances run by the Federal Reserve Board. They say to the interviewer, look at this card. Which of these categories do you feel best describes you? White, Black, or African-American, Hispanic, or Latino? And you can see that we have um, eight options here, including uh, a zero for sort of that, that missing uh, variable. Panel study of income dynamics. This is run out of the University of Michigan. What is your race? Are you white, Black, American, Indian? And you can see here that we have uh, six options. Why they don't use the number six instead of seven, I don't know. Uh, it's something I haven't uh, looked into yet. Um, but that's from the PSID. And finally, from the consumer expenditure uh, survey, uh, when you are filling out this survey, it's now all computer-based. Uh, there are nine different options here, uh, going from white at the top uh, to other at the very bottom. So now let me go back uh, through these uh, various surveys and let me highlight the first option in each of these uh, surveys. So in the decennial census, the first option is white. 
In the CPS, the first option is white with the number one. In the survey of income program participation, it's coded one and the first option is white. In the survey of consumer finances, the first option is white with the code one. PSID, first option is one with, with, uh, for white. And, whoops, lost my cursor there. And in the consumer expenditure survey, the first option is white again with the number one. So in all of these major federal programs, the first option, the default option, also coded with the number one, is white. And so therefore, I don't think it's, it's uh, necessarily surprising that when we look through the social science literature, we find that the order of, of results tends to be white, black, Hispanic, other, because they're simply taking the data out of these uh, surveys and then just popping them back out into their tables of their results. And again, what I think we need to do is to change this and to flip it around and to think about um, how we should, what is a better way to uh, present these data? Um, so um, the last thing I want to show about these surveys is how the decennial census has actually changed over time. Um, oops, wrong direction. Um, this is a really nice uh, graphic I thought from the Pew Research Center. It shows how um, the race questions and the census have changed over time. And I'm just gonna zoom in here. Um, so you can look at the top bar. Now in the first few censuses, we can see that we have the, the option is free white men and free white women. We have all other free persons and slaves. And notice as we go across into the 18, in 1850 census, we start with the term white um, relative, then we have black, mulatto, and other categories. As we move across, the one consistent thing that you can see in the census questionnaire from the beginning of the country is that the default, the top option is white, followed by um, categories of Blacks and African Americans, and then divided down into, into all of these other groups. Now, it may be the case that the white group comes first because it's the largest group. That is possible, but my guess is we are just taking that group as the default as opposed to taking a more active racial uh, equitable awareness to the way in which we collect the data and ultimately to the way we analyze it and then to process it and visualize it. So what can we do? as people who are working with data and visualizing data in, in terms of ordering these labels. So first off, let's, let's be more active about it. Let's be more purposeful about it. Let's not just take the order as they come out of the code book. Let's be more active about it. So does your study focus on a particular community? So if it does, maybe that group should come first because that's the focal point of your study or of your bar chart or of your table. Is there a particular argument or story that you're trying to tell? If so, if so, the order of the presentation of the results should reflect that argument, again, as opposed to just taking these, these default options. And then finally, is there a quantitative relationship that can guide how the groups are ordered? So maybe you order these based on the population size. And if it's a population size, white will in the United States will come first. But maybe it's, if it's ordered by sample size, that's not necessarily true. Maybe they should be ordered alphabetically, or maybe they should be ordered by magnitude or effect of the results. I don't know what the answer is here. And I don't think there is an answer. But what I do think is that we need to take a more active, constructive approach to this so that and we're not just taking data as it's given to us and then, just, and then just spit it back out. So before I go into considering missing groups, I'm going to turn over to the chat window real quick. So Santa asked about the, uh, the tones I used in the pie graph. Uh, I pulled those right out of the Pew uh, Research uh, Report, so I did not choose those colors. I remade the pie chart so that it was clear. I had a, If I blew it up uh, from the Pew, it, it looked kind of blurry, so I remade it. But those colors are directly from, uh, from those are the Pew Research uh, branding colors. Um, and Anthony mentions this whole notion of race, which I am going to talk about in just a little bit. Uh, if you haven't read this book, um, Cast. Uh, I do, uh, by Isabel Wilkerson, I really do um, uh, recommend it. And I have a quote from her here in a little bit, um, the difference. Um, there's also another book that uh, I just ordered by, um, I'm blanking on her name right now, but she distinguishes between race, uh, racial groups, ethnic groups, and nationality. So there's, so there's that as well. So I think I've caught up. Okay. So let's think about missing groups. So, so it's sort of a classic dilemma for those of us who are working with data is how do we deal with the groups that are missing? Uh, when it comes to taking your racial or gender, gender equitable approach, I, I think the easiest one to think about is gender, right? Gender is not binary, but nine out of 10 surveys, your options are male and female. 
Um, but I also want to dive in a little bit deeper into how we treat this other group, this missing group. So I actually was thinking harder about um, uh, this, this word other. And so I went to the Merriam-Webster dictionary. And so there's, there's five definitions here. And the one I want to focus on, the one that I think is the most interesting for this uh, discussion, this conversation, is this last definition. Um, is that other is defined as disturbingly or threateningly different. Um, and I find that uh, fascinating that the word other has this disturbing or threatening connotation to it. Um, and I think if you read some of the, this book cast, or if you read uh, Ibram Kendi's work, um, uh, uh, Stamp from the Beginning, or How to Be an Anti-Racist, you know, I think this reflects um, this, this structure, these structural racist, institutional racist policies, where we view the other as a threat, we view the other as different, and so therefore we must push them down or keep them away. So I think, I'm not sure what the answer is here, to be honest, because I haven't figured out what the right term is. Um, is it another group? Um, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is here, but I think the word other um, is problematic because of this, uh, inherently because of this connotation. Okay, so now we get into, sorry, I'm just gonna, um, uh, answer Sana's question. Thank you for the um, pronunciation. Okay, so yeah, so this, uh, so I think this is about the skin tones in the pie chart. So again, um, I think just to be clear that I believe that those are Pew's branding, branded colors. So they have these sort of uh, yellow, brownish branding colors. Um, so I, I would guess that that was not an intention on their part to try to tag the colors that they're using to the ethnicity that that was in part of that study. So, so I, I would be surprised if that was true. Um, and again, I just copied their their branded colors instead of trying to blow up that, that pie chart. But um, as it comes to colors, let's talk about using colors with a racial equity awareness. So I want to again show uh, dem start this by by uh, looking at a, an example. So this is from um, MIT, um, their student da uh, student diversity dashboard. Um, they have a number of different tabs. You hear this is all built in Tableau. You can see uh, tabs along the top. Um, there are a couple of drop down menus where you can look by different schools within uh, within the university. Um, they have changes in uh, the uh, share of uh, students of different racial and ethnic groups uh, over time on that left line chart. And then they have the breakdown across these different uh, parts of the university on the, on the right part of this uh, dashboard. What I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in. Uh, again, I'm going to remake it so, so it's their colors. Uh, I'm going to zoom in on the, on the legend here. And so this is the color palette that they use in the original dashboard. And so you notice here that we have um, nine different, um, nine different uh, uh, categories here. So on the left side of this, uh, of this legend, we have starting with black or African-American students, Hispanic or Latino students. Um, then we have Asian students at the bottom. And then on the top right, we have two or more races in the, in the, uh, in the, in the pink co pinkish color. And so before I go on to the rest, notice that that's using a sequential color palette going from light pink or light red to a dark red. Right? And we use the sequential color palette. If you think about making a, a map with sequential color palettes, we use sequential color palettes to imply a difference in quantities. So that if we made a map of the unemployment rate, for example, you know, light blue states would be states that had low unemployment rates, and dark blue states would be states that had high unemployment rates. And so this sequential color palette essentially implies some sort of ranking between these different races. Furthermore, notice that, the, that white students get this blue color that just pops out as if that's the only group or, or the group that we should be comparing all groups to. And then the international students and students presumably that, that didn't answer the survey um, or, or, or didn't answer the question, unknown, um, they are gray. So, so here's you have this, this dashboard where you basically group in um, these uh, people of color, students of color, into this sequential color palette of red you take whites out as if they are different, as if in some cases, as if they are the norm from these other groups and you separate those two. So this, um, this first dashboard, I wanna go back real quick. That was from June, uh, end of June of this year. Um, just a few weeks later, um, after a little bit of discussion on Twitter where we were kind of, we being people in the community talking about this, uh, tag them, um, they revised their dashboard and this is the new color palette that they have. So here you notice you have black or African American black or African-American students in green. But then again, you have Hispanic or Latino students, American Indians, Native Hawaiians, or Asian students, 
all new shades of blue. Two or more races gets a sort of purple. White is that orange color, international red, and gray is, is unknown. So again, I, I don't know that, I don't know, you know, picking nine colors is not an easy thing to do. And if the goal of the dashboard is to compare uh, white students to people of color, um, I, I guess that is a goal. I'm not sure that that is the goal that we want to, um, that we want to pursue, um, but, it, but that is a goal. So again, I don't have the answer. I, I'm not developing a nine uh, color palette here, but just to note how um, grouping uh, people of color or grouping these underrepresented groups into a single color palette, where I think the sequential color palette is uh, even worse, um, grouping those, uh, uh, those groups together creates a kind of us versus them, creates a hierarchy between these different uh, groups. Um, I brought this in just a, a few days ago. Um, I think this is a really interesting map and it's gotten me uh, sort of expanding my thinking here. And um, I will uh, just talk about this slide for a second and go back and see if uh, anyone uh, uh, in the chat box, if there are um, things I need to discuss here. Um, or maybe I'll just hang on to the end. So this is a map created by the Capital Area Food Bank. Uh, they uh, create uh, what they call their hunger report. So this is from the 2020 hunger report. It's a really nice uh, piece. I, I recommend you check it out. Um, and in the, they have this map. Uh, this is of the, of the DC uh, area, um, the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Um, this is a map of educational attainment. And so notice they have five different categories. So they have less than ninth grade, that's in red, high school graduate in orange, and then, and then graduate degree or higher in blue. Now, there's an added complication here that the uh, census tract is colored with the color that uh, um, corresponds to the majority of uh, people in that census tract. And then the saturation is changed based on, based on uh, how, how greater that share is within each of those tracts. So ignoring the saturation change for just a moment. My instinct when I see a map like this that shows educational attainment, my instinct is to use a sequential color palette, right? That I would go from say light red for less than ninth grade to dark red for graduate degree or higher. And I probably, I think, think that way because education clearly is very highly correlated with income. But in using that sequential color palette the way I just described it, light red to dark red, it implicitly suggests that being having a graduate degree is somehow better than having uh, having a high school degree, for example. And that's not necessarily true. It may be, you know, if we were looking at it by income, you know, I think you could argue that a hundred thousand dollars is better than fifty thousand dollars. But it doesn't necessarily hold true that people with a bachelor's degree are somehow better than people with a high school degree. So I actually think the hunger report here, um, is, even though it struck me as um, as not what I expected. I think they are actually taking the, the right approach and using this color palette. Okay, so I'm going to um, flip ahead one slide. Uh, before we get to icons, I'm just gonna take a look back at the, um, at the comments here. And, okay, so yeah, so I, yeah, so okay, so there's more conversation about Pew. I'm not really sure. Um, we can we can ask them. That I think is a, an interesting point. Um, and yes, I think Julie makes a great point. Um, whoops, uh, Julie makes a great point that um, these different categories are sort of bettering um, these groups. Um, yeah, so maybe the so Julie, yeah, so Julie, your your, your point is exactly right that. Um, income is more rather than better. So $100,000 is more than $50,000. Let me go back real quickly. Um, because another way to think about this is if I was plotting years of education, so if I was going one to, you know, whatever, um, in that case, I might use a sequential color palette because there isn't this sort of um, this bettering uh, value approach to that, that 20 years of education is more than 10 years of, of education. So um, again, so um, so Randy says sequential would be better in the hunger report. So again, I, I think, um, so I, 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 I don't, I, my instinct is I don't agree. Uh, I think they actually did this the right way. Of course, it, it adds, there's an added complexity here that they've changed the saturation of the color within each of these census tracts. So if you think of doing it that way, of the way that they've actually plotted the data, you physically couldn't use a sequential color palette, 
right? Because then you would mix, you would be mixing all of these things. So, um, so I think that's a that's an inherent problem in this particular map. But I think the way, just sort of generally speaking, I think the way that they not using that sequential color palette for these discrete categories of education. Again, if I was using years of education, uh, to use Julie's word, I might use the word better. Or, I'm sorry, I wouldn't use the word better. I would say more years of education is the dark blue color versus fewer years of education is the light blue color. Okay, so let's talk about icons. So um, I, many people on this call have probably seen this graphic before. This came out a while ago. Um, so, you know, I show this graph in my classes and my workshops to just instruct students and people to be careful when you're using icons, that you don't want to make implications about people uh, based on, um, uh, you don't want to make implications about people and you want to be thoughtful about the icons that you use. Um, but uh, last month, um, someone tweeted this out. So Saba Ibrahim, who's a photographer, tweeted this out. And she said, as an Indian woman, I can confirm that too much of my time is spent hiding behind a rock, praying the terrifying gang of international giant ladies and their Latvian general don't find me. Which I think, it, like, I see people smiling. I think it's, like, that's why I saved it. It's a great tweet. But taking away her uh, comedic reaction to this graphic, I think it's important to recognize that she's looking at this visualization as an Indian woman. And so it impacts her, even though this might just be a graph that flew by on her Twitter stream, it's a graph that impacts her. And so the message that comes through, even through these, these icons impact her in such a way. Um, and again, I'm not speaking, I don't wanna speak for her. Um, I think it's the perfect tweet. I'm gonna be using this in all of my classes now, but I think it just goes to show how our work as people visualizing and communicating data does have an impact on the people that we're talking about and that we are talking to. The other thing I want to note is um, is the uh, that these uh, disparities uh, persist. So if you go to Google and you type in the phrase nurse icon and you look in the image page, you will find images that the first whole page are going to be images that we would identify as being feminine. Um, and if you went into that same Google search and retyped and did boss icon, you would find a page of icons and images that we would identify as being, as being masculine. So these uh, disparities, these inequities are still continuing. They are still uh, uh, persistent in the technologies that we use uh, today. And so it's something that continues. And I think if we are, uh, if, or if you are, if I am uh, using icons in our uh, presentations, I think uh, we just need to be aware and careful of that. Okay, so I'm just looking again. Um, I'm not sure. So Stephanie wants to know about my co-author on the paper. So my co-author, Alice Fang, is a, a data visualization developer at the Urban Institute. Um, she's a co-author on the paper. She is moving tonight, um, so I wish her the best of luck. She was unable to make the talk, so um, that's why she is uh, not here tonight. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is demonstrating empathy um, with the people that we are talking to and talking uh, or, or working, the data that we're working uh, with and, and who we are communicating with. So uh, Kim Bui, who I don't know if I actually pronounced her, her last name right, uh, from datajournalism.com, uh, she wrote this really great blog post about empathy. And she said, approaching stories in people with more empathy creates better relationships with marginalized communities, builds trust and increases diverse coverage. So. Um, I, I think, you know, this idea of empathy is something that I think people in the data visualization field have been talking uh, about for uh, a while. Um, and it's something I think that really comes, uh, has come to the fore in the current uh, situation in which we are in, that we need to be thinking about what, how do people that we are studying and communicating with, how do they receive the information um, that we are telling them? And when it comes to uh, specific graphics, um, it may be that particular chart types lend themselves better or well to more of a human connection than others. So uh, unit charts, for example, um, maybe they lend themselves to more of a human connection than others. Um, so the bar chart that you, you know, the, the single bar, you know, that's collapsing all the people um, into just one shape as opposed to an icon chart, a unit chart, an isotype chart. Um, they might offer more of, a, of an opportunity to connect with the people. So it, it I, 
again, I think, I don't have the answers here. Um, I, I think by reminding our readers of the number of people represented, uh, represented in our data through the use of these multiple individual shapes, be them the, someone noted the, the we people here, yep, from ProPublica, um, or just the simple uh, different, uh, different shapes themselves, um, maybe that helps people understand or, or, or uh, connect with the fact that we have people in our data set, that there are people um, actually come uh, from, from our data set. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is, is engaging or reflecting, engaging with or reflecting people's lived experiences. And again, I have my own lived experience, my own, my own experiences uh, working in this topic and thinking about this topic. So what can we do as, um, as, as, data, as people working with data and visualizing data and analyzing data? Um, so are we, so again, these are, I, I think the message here is um, that there are, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there are any rules, but I think the message that I'm trying to uh, get across here is that we need to at least, at the very least, be thinking about these issues. Um, and we need to, um, uh, if we can think about these issues, we can be more conscious and strategic and, and purposeful about the words and the colors and the icons that we use. So are we using language that is consistent with how people refer to themselves and others? Um, what have we missed in our visuals that are inconsistent within a racial equity framework? What are the words that we are using? That, what are the colors that are using? What are the icons that we're using that may not be consistent with having more racial equitable awareness? And how can we take a more empathetic approach to creating data visualizations that accurately and respectfully account for other people's lived experiences? So again, I mentioned earlier that I think many of us are probably uh, steeped or rooted in this, this uh, training or skill set of being quantitative people and maybe not uh, the qualitative uh, approach that maybe we need to have more of. Maybe we need to go out there and talk to more people and more fully understand their lived experiences. The final thing that tags with this is thinking about this within organizations and groups and teams. And so this is from Isabel Wilkerson's book, CAS. Um, and she, I mean, it's a great book. It is a heavy book, um, so, so be prepared if you, if you, if you read it. Um, the human impulse to create hierarchies runs across societies and cultures, predates the idea of race, and thus is farther reacher, reaching, farther reaching deeper and older than raw racism and the comparatively new division of humans by skin color. So someone uh, mentioned uh, something about this uh, earlier in the chat box. So when it comes to groups, I think what we can do is we can use the culture in our organization to inform how we do our analysis and use our analysis to inform our culture within our organizations and, and uh, more, more broadly. So um, if we are working in teams that may, have, that may not have underrepresented groups, our analysis is going to suffer from that because we will have less experience in how to speak to those groups that we want to study. Similarly, if we are doing our analysis and let's say um, we're not sure how to order our variable names, or we're not sure whether we should use the phrase Hispanic, Latino, or Latinx. If we have people in our organization that we can ask, that we can openly talk to and have these hard, honest conversations, that's going to make our analysis better. So the culture within our organizations and the analysis we do both individually and within our organizations, I think these all feed together. And together, I think they can improve the way in which we communicate and visualize our data. So I'll just wrap up here with, with one last thing. And, and just to say that, uh, that data are a reflection of the lives of real people. They're not just a, a sterile abstraction. And so as you think about visualizing your data, think about the people that you're studying, the people that you are communicating with, and how those people are going to receive the information as you share it with them. And I think if we can take a more thoughtful, uh, purposeful uh, approach to this and be willing to have these hard conversations where we're not always gonna get everything right, we're not gonna say everything right, I think in that way, we'll be better off and be able to better communicate and affect policy and change for the better. So I'm gonna stop there and turn it back to Naomi and um, I'm happy to answer um, other questions. So thanks, Naomi. Okay, um, are there questions? You are all muted. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, Rich, who is our security officer, will unmute you, uh, but start by asking your question in the chat and let Rich know if you'd like to speak. 
Yeah. So yeah. So if you if you like to unmute and, and have a conversation, that's great. I'm happy to talk as long as we need to, um, because again, I don't have the answers here, and I'm very much looking for feedback and other people's thoughts. I'll. In the meantime, until uh, I see someone want to unmute themselves, there's um, a couple of questions in here. I'm just going to scroll back up. If I miss your question, um, feel free to just repost it. So Hope wants to ask, or Hope asks, is there institutional pushback to these actions? Um, so it's a it's a it's a really good question. I mean, so so Hope's question seems to be more on the ordering of surveys. So. Um, so my full-time job at the Urban Institute, we don't run a we don't run a lot of big surveys, so I can't really answer um, that to that particular uh, aspect of this. Um, you know, I, I would say I would okay. So I can only again uh, talk about this from my experience at at where I have worked. So um, other people should feel free to weigh in on, on pushback that they may have received. Um, so. Um, I think at least at, Ur at Urban right now, we are having hard conversations about how we as an organization treat each other and how we think about taking our research with a more, with a, with a, with a racial, with a more structural racial lens to the work that we should be having these hard conversations and that when we are um, producing work on child nutrition issues, that we should be taking a, 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 stronger lens and a stronger look at these at these racial equitable issues and we've been doing that for a long time but it's sort of under the hood now, maybe this will crystallize it for you so another thing that i'm working on right now is thinking about how social scientists talk about the results so i don't know if there are any economists or social scientists out there but um you know when you run a regression uh social scientists run a regression there's some outcome variable there's going to be a group of demographic variables so race education uh gender what have you there's a group of socioeconomic variables, so income, housing values, whatever it is. And there's be some sort of policy values, so sort of policy variables. So what are the levers that, that policymakers can, can turn? And what happens far more often than not is that the, um, the social scientists will write about the policy levers, write about, oh, if we pulled this or if we did this, this is how we can affect this for the better. But they don't ever go back to look at the, or, or write about the racial variables, the race variables and the, and the coefficients on the race variables. And if you're to argue and say that I have control for everything in my regression, and yet this variable on black households is positive and statistically significant, then that's saying something. Right? I don't know what I don't necessarily know what it's saying, but it might be reflecting something about structural inequality and structural racism, and those things are being ignored. Um, so I think there's, and why is that happening? I think a we haven't been, uh, we haven't been thinking about these issues carefully enough. I think b, and this is actually something that I've heard from many people, if you have your paper and you're focusing on these other variables that are not central to your story of how do I change, you know, food stamp participation rates. Um, if I, there's not focal to that argument, then the peer review is, I'm not going to get through peer review and people who read are not going to value those things. So I think in that, in that sense, there is an institutional pushback to this, um, but it's sort of, I think a, maybe a little more zoomed in on some specific, um, sectors and, 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 and areas of study rather than, um, institutional wide, at least, at least in my experience. Um, so I'm going to just go back here. Um, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad to see people um, uh, enjoy this. Yes. So the couple. So the recording is up, and I am going to share the slides uh, once we have that. Um, there is a comment here about um, race and medical clinical trials, which um, I really don't have any experience with, but um, clearly is a is a huge is a huge issue. Um, Luke asks about uh, color palettes when visualizing ethnicity. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, and I can't think of any resources off the top of my head. Um, I can't say for gender that Lisa Charlotte Roast from Data Wrapper had this really nice blog post a while back that I sh think she sort of just pulled together more recently on um, uh, colors for gender. So baby blue and baby pink, which we all, I think we all agree is like terrible um, and how news organizations, what colors they're using for, for, for genders, which I thought was a really nice post. Also, just as an aside, um, 
the baby blue, baby pink thing is, is very recent. It only started in like the 1950s or 1960s. Before then, it was actually the opposite. Um, that blue was used to represent women and red for men. Um, and I have this book somewhere. It's, um, um, uh, now I'm blanking on the name. Uh, Cassia St. Clair has this great book on color. And she explained that red was uh, for men because it was more represented or, or people thought it represented blood and war, which is described as the masculine. And then blue is more ascribed to paintings of the Virgin Mary, which is more feminine. So, but for some reason it switched in the 1950s. And so we have this thing now. So anyway, um, okay. So just scrolling through and feel free to uh, ask Rich to unmute yourselves. I don't you believe that, John. I, no? was, I was around before the 50s. And <laughs> I always associated pink with girls and <laughs> and blue with boys. So maybe I, it's just, maybe it's just in the UK. I don't know. I will um, check with some contemporaries, but I don't ever remember red and blue for, like that. So oh, so there's a lot of questions here. Okay, so secret lies of color. Yes, Luke has the post. Great. Um, Randy has a question. How would you address issues in the data that many races slash ethnic groups also consider themselves white, but in surveys are forced to choose one? For example, many Hispar Hispanics also identify as white. Yeah, this is, a, this is a great question. And you'll notice in the decennial census, you are now, um, uh, you now have the option to choose multiple categories and also to fill in the multiple, the, the um, you can write in. So if you wanna write in German or Polish um, or, or Tunisian or Sierra Leone, you can, you can write that in. Obviously, for, for us as, as data people, this makes our lives more complicated. <laughs> but, you know, it's also, uh, you can look at it as it makes our lives more complicated, but it also enriches the analysis that we can do. And, and I think there's something to be said for, instead of having four categories, we now have 20 categories. And, and, and that's great. And that's, and that's something, to, um, uh, to be, to, something to be said for that. But I think to, um, to Randy's question, I'm sure there's more people on this call who can answer this better than I. I would suspect that when you don't see yourself in a federal survey, I think that probably um, uh, says something to you as a person living in this country, as a citizen of this country, um, that you're not valued in the same way that some of these other groups are. That when you see white in every survey as the number one option in every survey that you answer, that that says something, I think that says something about how we value different groups and different people in this country. And again, um, I don't necessarily have that, that personal experience or that personal feeling, but I can, I could certainly uh, imagine how, how that might, that might feel. Um, so let's see. So John asks, uh, will there be infinite possibilities for the race questions? I mean, that's, that's a great question. I mean, same with gender. I mean, you know, will gender just be like a slider? I mean, I, I don't, I mean, not even a slider is not even the right UI. I don't even know what the right UI is. Um, I mean, maybe, it, maybe it will be, maybe there are no checkboxes and maybe you just, maybe you just write in, I, I don't know. Um, and, you know, how do we define race? You know, we go back to that Isabel Wilkerson uh, quote, you know, this, this term race is, is fairly new as a, as another example, um, the, the word Caucasian is not actually a scientific term. The word Caucasian basically came out from, and I have the slide here somewhere, uh, so uh, I didn't get to it, um, but the word Caucasian, and I wanna make sure I get this right, um, was coined uh, in, I believe, the early 1800s. Um, and it was coined by Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, which is a, a great name, and notice I didn't try to do the uh, Austrian or German accent there. Um, but it was coined, um, he um, uh, collected and analyzed skulls and his favorite skull was from the Caucasus mountains of Russia. So that's where the word, the, the word Caucasian comes from. It's not a scientific term. So we have designed and developed these, these racial terms and categories, um, but they're not necessarily um, based on, on science. As we all know from the Genome Project, um, we're, all, we're all the same underneath, we're all the same. Um, so it's, so, you know, there's, there's obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of people on this call who know more about this than I do. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, um, uh, yeah. Emma wanted to ask 
question live and is unmuted. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Richard, for that. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, hi, John. So thanks for your Bye. presentation. I actually have two questions. So the first is more about the the comment you made about, you know, what's sort of valued in different spaces. So thinking more broadly about the use of like statistics or different types of methodologies, right? So oftentimes even folks who do qualitative methods will, will sort of feel the pressure to sort of quantify yeah. um, their findings in some way, right? And so, yep. um, I wonder if you could maybe speak to a little bit about how maybe that just has more to do with how we're sort of taught methods and, you know, what methodologies are valued in different spaces and um, what are maybe some of the more harmonious ways that we can begin to think about integrating different types of methodologies and getting away from this sort of binary notion of qual versus quant or quant versus yeah. qual. Yeah, that's a great question. Do you want to ask your, did you have another question? Uh, it did. And it had to. I think someone else had also asked this question, and it had to do uh, with the bivariate Korpleth uh, yeah. slide and thinking through there more so the design. So, from a design aspect, I, for me, the Korpleth is pretty, but from a sort of policy or applied research lens, uh, whenever I sort of you know work with folks who are interested in looking at the intersections of two different continuous variables that are geo or map uh, located, I always mm -hmm. sort of say, you know, do a scatter plot and then go and map it to see what right. it looks like. And so yeah. thinking through there for that question for me is what are some of the pitfalls that you have seen with the design and how we map on some of these different types of data uh, mm -hmm. to uh, these different types of uh, encoded uh, graphs okay. and charts? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Let me, um, I'll just take those in, in turn. So. On the qual versus quant um, um, issue, I mean, I think so. So I'll, I'll say a couple things. So when I teach data visualization and give talks, the qualitative people always come up to me and and say, "I'm a basically what you just said. How can I quantify my data so that I can create a bar chart or a pie chart or whatever?" And my response to that is always don't feel like you need to immediately quantify your data. The thing that qualitative researchers have as an advantage over those of us who are more uh, quantitative researchers is that they talk to people. And talking to people, that's how readers react, right? That's how we connect with the information is by hearing the stories and, and seeing how, you know, what people's experience are, experiences are. So I think, you know, if for anyone who's a qualitative researcher, um, I would encourage you not to think of it as, um, as a negative that it's so hard to sort of quantify my data that it's actually a positive that you're able to connect um, with the people that you're studying and also the people who are going to be reading or using your data visualization in ways that us quantitative people, I kind of count myself a quantitative person, um, uh, that us quantitative people uh, can't. And to your, to your other question about teaching methods, I mean, I, I, I mean, like I've been, I've been arguing for a long time that graduate programs, specifically economics, because that's my, that's my experience, um, need to be doing a better job of teaching people how to present, people, teaching people, students how to write, teaching, teaching students how to create data visualizations. Add to that, teaching students how to conduct qualitative research, because it's far too easy to go off into your graduate student cubicle and download some data and start running some regressions and not think about the people that are behind the survey and not think about the people that you're communicating with. So, you know, I, I think qualitative researchers, the ones that I know at least, the qualitative researchers that I know all have some quantitative background and method skills. Um, they certainly, the ones that I know, would never call themselves an econometrician or a statistician, but they know how to run a regression. They know how to calculate uh, 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 measures of dispersion. Um, but the same doesn't hold true for the quantitative people. The quantitative people really have no idea how do you set up a survey? How do you actually talk to a human being, right? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's not even so much um, meet in the middle. It's more that the quantitative folks need to, need to take some steps this way. Um, let me go back to the, um, uh, because you asked about the bivariate choropleth map. Um, actually, I can, I can uh, here's the viz. I can just put it in the chat window here. Um, that's, the, that's the viz if you want to go look at it. Um, so, I mean, I, I agree with you that I, I have a hard time reading, um, uh, 
bivariate core clefts. And I'm, I'm going to, while I talk here, I'm going to try to find another one real quick. I think they can be done uh, well and they can be done uh, poorly. Um, I think this is a, I mean, I think the, the issues that the creator was trying to um, get to here was, was uh, done, was important. And I think it's a nice way to do it. Um, but I'm also going to throw some other bivariate core clef maps um, that I just have. Uh, this is a tweet from Martin Lambrooks. I'll put that in here too, so you can take a look. I mean, for me, anytime I see one of these, it's it's I find them very hard to um, very hard to read uh, and hard to understand. Um, I can I'm trying to find there is one that I like. I think this one. So this last one from the WoodwellClimate.org. I actually like this one. I think because um, the color palette made more sense to me. And maybe that's just my my issue with a lot of these. It is hard to come up with this bivariate choropleth where the colors make sense. You know, when we go back to, um, let me share this one again. So the one I shared earlier, uh, here it is. You know, it's just hard to go along either of these. Let me go down one to the zoom in. It's hard to, to talk about either one of these um, either one of these dimensions, right? Because it's not like the horizontal category. I'm going to go down to the, to the one that I like better. It's not like the horizontal category goes from a light gray to a dark gray. And the vertical category goes from, I mean, on that side, it goes from a light blue to a light purple to a dark purple. But it's not, it's not in both of those directions. Whereas if I show this option, if you've looked at this, you know, this one kind of works, I think, in a, in a little bit of a better way. Right, kind of light orange, dark orange, and then the blues. I'm not sure. I, I, I think uh, um, I share your frustration with the bivariate core plus map, and but I appreciate the fact that people are trying it. This is the only way that we get to new graph types that we uh, that we can use and that we can um, become part of our our toolbox um, is by is by trying them and and exploring and succeeding and failing. So I appreciate that people are trying them, but I, I also have uh, some challenges with with um, John, with these numbers. yeah. Are you familiar with the book by Dan Carr and Linda Pickle, visualizing uh, data patterns with micromaps? Yeah, it's in this bookcase here somewhere. Everybody, um, I highly recommend it, and Linda Pickle will be speaking to us probably the first week in December, and um, I. She's a wonderful person to ask questions to on any type of mapping and alternatives to chloropleth maps. Great. Um, just want to see. Um, I think there was another question earlier about um, my work on this project and, and where it came from. So I'll I'll just quickly um, I'll just quickly tell I'll tell the quick story behind this. So. Um, if you don't know, the Urban Institute has a fairly uh, detailed uh, data visualization style guide, which I will put into the uh, chat box here. Um, and so um, my colleague, uh, Alice Fang and I have been working on revising that style guide um, to not just update some of our styles, but also to really build this style guide out uh, for uh, both open source and also for obviously for people at Urban with more resources um, and templates and, 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 and both R and JavaScript and Excel, which don't get me started on how hard that's going to be. Um, but in our work of, of building this style guide, we're adding sections on accessibility. So um, one, you know, so for example, one thing that we've already put into place at Urban that's not in the style guide, but just become a policy is that um, researchers who submit um, a blog post, um, for those who submit a blog post where you're going to have an image on the blog, you as the researcher are responsible for writing the alt text for that image. So um, it used to be sort of the wild west, um, a blog editor or our, our web team would just throw some alt text there at the end of the process, right? At the end is it's going up and it wasn't really given the thoughtful approach that it needed. Um, and so one thing we've already instituted just in drafting the style guide is that researchers are now required to write their own alt text. And so we've been giving them some pointers on, you know, how do you write good alt text? What does that mean? Um, we're also writing a section on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is where this work was, was born out of. And so um, uh, Alice is in the, the DataViz developer team. So that's a, um, a 
three person team. Um, I sort of sit in multiple places. Um, and so um, Alice is amazing um, and does amazing work. If you, um, she's done a couple of things lately. Um, she couldn't be here tonight. Unfortunately, I wanted her to talk about this project. Um, and if you read our paper, um, that's linked to on the on the blog posts that was uh, linked. You'll see um, um, you'll see uh, where how this project, this particular project, takes a racial equitable approach. So the original the original design for this uh, was changed to take this this uh, different approach. Oops, I didn't put this in the um, in the chat box. There we go. Um, and I'll also just point to one more thing that she did recently. Um, and then I will, there was another question, actually, while I find it, um, I think someone, yes, uh, Elie was going to ask a question, and I think she's unmuted, so. It's Ellie. Ellie, um, oh, oh, yes, no that's worries. an L. I'm getting old, I can't. You're okay. Really okay. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, it occurs to me, especially just because you, you just mentioned, um, accessibility in um, presenting these visualizations, that there's a sort of fundamental tension between taking advantage of the ways that we've been trained, not just us, but the general public has been trained to interpret visualizations, like, like the, I think the educational attainment scale that you showed <clears throat> that had, <clears throat> it went from like red to blue, but it had purple in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, that's extremely counterintuitive, I think, to anybody's notion of like, you know, scale greater than versus mm -hmm. less than with like something weird in the middle. Um, so it occurs to me that there's like a tension between taking advantage of like of, of sort of the grammars that we have in interpreting visualizations and then disrupting the stereotypes that we apply to our interpretations of these. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like that's sort of the or like one gloss on the effort that you're you're trying to help us participate in. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I, I guess what I'm wondering is like, um, when we're talking about those bivariate choropleths, I totally agree that the, that the one where the south is like dark purple and everything else, like there's a scale that goes from like yellow to red and purple right. to black. And then the horizontal scale, I don't know what that is. Like there's like gray in the middle. And right. Um, right. so I think the problem there is that like, we can't track like, a more versus less on the horizontal scale. So I guess what I'm wondering is like, how do you think about balancing the tension between like the accessibility of using a legible grammar, you know, in terms of like bigger to littler um, mm -hmm. versus that disruption? Um, because I guess like my tendency has been to try to do more of the disrupting in the captions and in mm -hmm. sort of the choice of colors, but maybe not so much in like, say like the ranking of the colors or, or the, um, right. you know, like not disrupting like the sort of Roy G. Biv expectations that people have in terms of bigger and littler. Um, right. Because, because the, the, pull, the tension that I get there is from editors saying like, why did you screw up the colors like this? No one can interpret your graph. Yeah, I mean, so, I, 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 yeah, yeah. How successful do you think, you know, we can be, or what other ways have you thought of beyond well, let me, let me screwing with those. put it this way. So, okay. So I think the challenge is that I'm going to unmute you because I'm getting just a little bit of feedback, but, but we can unmute you again. Um, um, so I think the challenge is, so great question, and I'm not going to have the answers. So you're probably going to be disappointed. Um, um, the, the challenge is that there's this balance between familiarity and what's um, maybe a better approach. So let's take a couple of simple examples. Pink and blue for men and women. You put pink and blue on a graph, people know what it is. But we also all agree that it's super condescending, okay? Um, another good example is just creating maps, right? We know that people love maps because they can see themselves in the data. I mean, I'm in Virginia, you're all, some of you are in New York. I, if I look at a map of the United States, I know where those two places are. But we also know that they're not the best, necessarily the best way to present data, that, the, that there's a geographic distortion that occurs because of the size of the geography of the state. So I think what you're getting at, Ellie, which is my daughter's name, um, is this balance between familiarity and um, trying to get to a better state. And so how do we get to a better state 
because we're inherently, it's inherently a, a trade-off, right? We're trying to get to this better state. And so by, by definition, we're going to make things that are less familiar. I mean, my argument to that, and this is specific, this is more to data visualization specifically than to our conversation tonight. My, my answer to that has always been when I hear people say, I could never make a dot plot or a slope chart or whatever, because my boss or manager or audience would never get it. I always point to the New York Times. Like if you go back 10 years ago, the scatter plots that the New York Times were making had 20 points on them, 25 points on them. And now they have scatter plots with hundreds of points on them. And the reason that they were able to evolve from this point, this place of having scatter plots with 20 points on them to scatter plots with hundreds of points of them is because they instructed and educated their readers about how to read these graphs so that over time, a scatter plot for the average New York Times reader is just like a pie chart, a bar chart, a line chart. It's just one of those native charts to them because they've been educated over, the, over this time. And they didn't even know it, right? It's like how you teach kids math, right? They don't even know that they're learning algebra. And then they get to eighth grade, they're like, wait, this is algebra? And you're like, yeah, you've been learning it for three years. You just didn't realize it. So the answer to, to part of your question, I think, is to continually push and continually figure out ways to instruct the reader on how to read these changes so that they slowly become part of their, 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 their graphic literacy, becomes part of their, um, their basic understanding. Um, and then the other part is, um, along with that, is maybe not to go from zero to 60 right away, right? So um, I, I, I taught a, a workshop uh, last fall for a group uh, on presentations. And uh, a guy came up to me at the end and he said, you know, I really want to do all this. I want to get rid of all the words on my slides and I want to use pictures and icons and illustrations, but I have to do it at a board meeting this week. And if I do that, they're just going to laugh at me. I said, well, you don't need to go zero to 60. Just take a small change, you know, instead of showing all three bullet points on your slide, do three separate slides and just walk them through it. And, um, and I had to come back the following week for, for like an office hour thing. And he's like, I, I went for it. I just, I did the whole thing. I just went for it. And they all loved it. And I was like, that's great. You didn't need to do that, but that's, that's, that's a great story. So, you know, Christine just mentioned in the chat box that, that change often comes in baby steps. And I think that's, I think that's exactly right. And I think to circle back to, to the conversation for tonight, uh, and I'm listening to a, a podcast, a new episode of, uh, and I'm for blanking on the name, so I'm gonna look it up, of Small Doses. Uh, if you haven't listened to this podcast, this is a great podcast. Um, the Small Doses podcast. Um, and this week's episode, the new episode that just came out, um, is with Layla Sad, who's who's written this this great book. This is a book on um, uh, that I just started reading. Um, so great. So other people have, have listened to this. My wife just turned me on to the show, and, and I'm like hooked. Um, but um, the the point that one of the points that was made in in the current episode is that while the change that we're talking about at the moment seems like a break, it seems like maybe we've had, we've hit a, a, a I don't want to say a turning point. Uh, we've hit this, this, this moment. Um, that change is going to take, it's going to take a long time, right? Because we're breaking down decades of discrimination, decades of racism, um, a history in the United States that we really have not come to terms with. Um, and so those things are going to take time to do. And so um, I think, you know, back to kind of your core question, Ellie, I think a lot of this is just um, taking it uh, slow and working to educate both, um, educate both your readers and your editors also and why these changes are important and why they're valuable and, and why they'll have a good payoff in the end. Um, So um, Randy wants to know about my, when I worked at CBO and had the challenge of designing data this without using color. Um, actually, we did use color. Um, we might not have been great at it, but we were allowed to use color. I will say, so we, it wasn't that we weren't allowed to use color. It's that we, um, um, you know, DC, for those of you who are not in DC, uh, DC is a print town. So you have to, um, maybe less so than um, when I was, when I, I left about six years ago, uh, maybe less so now, but um, when you're designing for print, you do have to think about it in a different way, 
than when you are um, uh, designing it for obviously digital or even when you have color printing. And, and during my time there, we basically moved away from color printing um, and more towards the uh, black and white because it's so, so expensive. Um, so, you know, so we were allowed to use color um, and, you know, towards and, and during the end of my tenure there, you know, we started making more infographics. I'll say this about the infographics that originally when I started making infographics, this is around maybe the height of the infographic craze um, that, you know, we were really into creating the, the tower infographics. And quickly, um, I realized that even distilling a 200 page report down to a tower infographic wasn't short enough. That especially for our audience, ECBO's audience, it needed to be eight and a half by 11 and need to be printed out with something that could be printed and carried. Um, so I would say it, it wasn't so much about the color. It was so much as it always is, is thinking about the audience, the platforms they're using, um, how they're going to use the information and, and what they're going to do with the information. Um, does, uh, does, uh, so I'll just, I'll just give one more option here if anybody, um, I put um, Alice's uh, new story in the pudding. Alice Fang wrote a cool story in the pudding that I put in the chat box. Um, and the uh, pulse tool, um, <clears throat> if you're interested in, in using the census pulse data, uh, Urban has a cool new uh, tool that you can uh, play around with. Um, does anybody have any other questions either in the chat window or they wanna be unmuted? I'm happy to keep talking. John, I need to leave. I'm gonna unmute. I'm gonna allow everyone to unmute themselves. All right. So this is where it gets dangerous, everybody. And throw things to the walls. And, and to everyone, <laughs> apologies that um, we had such tight security. Um, things got really bad at the last one. And Thanks, my poor Rich. mom got exposed to some language she had never heard before. <laughs> so, um, so we had to uh, to tighten things up. But thank you so much, John. It's been fabulous. Thanks, and I thank need you. to drop in two minutes. Thank you. And I apologize for the confusion at the beginning, but as I said, um, I was not able to send you a message. So I dumped it on poor Rich and said, just log into my account. And by the way, most of the messages that have my name on that were done tonight were from Rich because he's better at multitasking than I am these days. But in any case, um, I just told him to send it and wasn't clear enough about what the link should be and he just took it he took the dummy one and sent it out not realizing <laughs> so uh, i'm glad all of you were here my apologies really go to the people who didn't get on um so there are a couple questions in here I, again i'm happy to keep talking if you all everyone needs to run feel free to run uh there's still 30 minutes until the hockey game so i'm good to go um so there's a question Let's here say, about- If anybody wants to be unmuted now, uh, message me because Rich has to go. I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, someone asked about um, uh, data viz inspiration, um, which is a great question. Um, I'll just put in, uh, in uh, this in the chat window, my what I call my data visualization catalog. Um, it's just a collection of data visualizations that I use um, for teaching and for inspiration. And it's just, uh, it's open um, uh, for you to go in and play around with and download and, and grab anything. So, um, so I, um, you know, I, I, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, as, as you all, as you all likely know, there's, there's people doing great work out there. So I tend to follow the New York Times, the Post, the Guardian, the Financial Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Pudding, um, I can go on and on. Um, uh, but if you're, you know, I, I, I do, I basically collect visualizations for my own use, um, both in terms of thinking about, oh, how could I create, it's usually something like, oh, how could I create that in, in a tool like Excel? Um, or uh, yeah, I could apply that to, to my own data. So um, it's a lot of reading and, and writing and it's also, um, recognizing that your next great data visualization might come from your kid's English, you know, language book. It might not come from tableau.com or from powerbi.com, right? It might come, can come from anywhere. So inspiration really can come from anywhere. Um, and let's see, maybe there's just, um, 
So there's a question about uh, my transition um, outside of academia. So, so just to be clear, um, I'm, I was never a full-time uh, academic. Um, I worked at a small uh, nonprofit in New York City for a few years after graduate school. And then I worked at the Congressional Budget Office for about 10 years, and now I'm at the Urban Institute. So my transition was really from uh, government to the nonprofit world. Um, and, um, and people, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll uh, tweak your question a little bit. Um, people have also often asked me, why don't I start my own firm full time? You know, like a, a Cole Naflick or an Ann Emery or, or a Naomi. Um, and uh, my response to that is I, I still identify as a researcher uh, at, at heart. So I do spend half my time doing, doing research. Um, and so that's still where I identify and that's, uh, and, and that's where I feel I can still do, uh, have the most impact is by helping the people that I work with at Urban and, and in other places, but at Urban, uh, where I can help those people, my colleagues, uh, improve the way that they communicate their work. And, and so that's the way that, um, and, and that work can then have an impact, be it at the local level or, or even the federal level, um, and everywhere in between. Um, but I, but I still, uh, love doing research and still identify as a researcher. So that's why I've, um, you know, I kind of tweaked your question a little bit, but that's, but that's, um, why I still, uh, 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 uh stick around in a place like urban. Um, so, uh, question about, um, is there like a, uh, Hope wants to know, is there like a boot camp for data science, um, uh, data science boot camp? Um, a 12 week boot camp not requiring any real stats. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I would open it up to the group if anybody knows. Um, uh, I think the one thing I will say is to get a data science certificate or degree without having um, some statistics background is, is not going to pay off in the long run. That you need, you don't need to be an econometrician, but you do need to understand. Um, I wouldn't even say just basic statistics, just whatever intermediate statistics is. Um, uh, understand. I mean, I'm not going to go into the list, but you know, move on from general measures measures of dispersion to um, survey design to uh, symmetry and asymmetry in uh, in distributions. Um, some basic understanding of how, how regressions work and what they do and what they measure. Uh, what is the p-value? What is a hypothesis test? Um, so, um, you know, I think if you're, if you're interested in, in those sorts of, or if you're interested in becoming, getting into the data science world, I think you, you know, you, you need, it's, it's, it goes beyond coding and it goes beyond data visualization. Um, it goes beyond, uh, well, I guess machine learning is some people say regressions are machine learning, which makes me a little sad um, or happy. I can't tell. Um, but I would, uh, I, I would encourage you to, to think about, you know, getting that statistics um, training as well. Um, so I'll just hang out for another couple of minutes. And if no one has any questions, uh, we can all go get dinner or at least I'll go get dinner and Naomi can go get dinner. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, good question. Who I'm rooting for? I'm not really rooting for anybody. I just uh, my team's the Caps, and they embarrass themselves this year, so I'm just looking forward to it. So, all right, everybody. Um, thank you very much, uh, Naomi. I'll, I'll send it back to you to uh, to close us out. I cannot thank you enough, John. As you can tell from the number of questions and the length of the session, it was certainly appreciated and. Many people have lots to think about. I thank all of you for coming and I hope to see you in the future. I welcome all the first timers. There are many of you here. I welcome all my regulars and I welcome the people from outside the New York area. The one good thing about, if there is anything good about our situation these days is that we are able to get speakers from a much broader area and attendees from a much better area. So, thank you. Thanks everybody. Take care, stay safe and stay healthy.